I'm gonna wait for a couple more minutes. I'm just checking uh stuff I'm gonna talk about. enough okay so i think a lot a decent amount happened between then and now i think a week i think a week passed i think a week passed yeah because i got school which means i have to go to school throughout the whole week and then i can only stream on the weekends but i'm gonna go over what essentially uh what i did and explain something really important about the language Let's go here. So this is stream 18 and basic implementation of global constant evaluation. So I did const eval and basically the core concepts of that was essentially allocating all the locals. So you, you need to build a stack frame. So you need to allocate all the locals and then you can read and write and those locals can be undefined. So you need to put like tag bits. Uh, essentially it was really simple. It was really, it was a really simple uh, constant evaluator and I didn't really get much done in that stream. I only got, I only got simple, simple addition, reading and writing. So I'm going to talk about that. Okay. So integer literal ABI overflow tracks. Okay. So I'll go over these one by one. Uh, the most important thing is this thing. So, uh, where is it? Here. Yeah. This is important. HIR fits in. So type, uh, HIR. Hi like Kirby. All right, so integer fits in. This gets called, yeah, and I'll open up and open up a file. This is important. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, so take a look at these. These are all of the int min max. So you have i8 all the way up to i64, u8 all the way up to u64. You compile them and they run just fine. So I just make, yeah. So uh, you see these like const down here. Uh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'll explain that to later. But you can see here that main uh, i i eight min i eight max these things they're actual values, right? Hi QP. No, I'm not playing Cruelty Squad. I don't play video games. So, uh, so this is here, let's only take a look at the u eight maxes here. So let's take a look at u sixty four max. And this is basically the largest number you can sh you can fit into a 64-bit integer. So you run it, and essentially uh, you end up. Let me just uncomment all these things. Okay. Uh, okay, fine. These need to stay. But uh, here, this thing main dot u64 max, and this is the largest thing you can stuff inside a integer literal. And I can show you how integer literals are, are represented. It's just uh, the integer, and it's just just a u64. It's just a U64. And let's say I make this instead of 15, 16. All right, what happens? Integer literal too large to fit in 64 bits. Okay, good, good. Now let's say I made this type a U30, an I32. Oh wow, this has an error. Okay, so this this should error. Okay, but yeah. 
All right, fine. U U thirty two. Now this errors. Now this errors. So I think this is like some sign sign extension thing. This this needs to be checked. But this thing. So this is obviously too large to fit inside a U sixty four. Let me put big two do here. Yeah. So this is too big to fit inside an I sixty four. It's it's basically uh in max for a U sixty four. So it won't fit. So let's find out where this gets essentially raised. And right here. So we call this function called integer underscore fits underscore in. So we pass in an on error type and the literal. The literal being just the U64 representation of the integer. And it calls this function type ABI integer fits in. ABI stands for application binary interface. I'm just copying the naming convention that the Rust interpreter, the Rust const interpreter does. So essentially, we just call it with the ABI, which is, this is a global variable. This represents the basically the target, the semantics of the target. And we pass in the literal and its type. And we'll see what happens. Uh, let's go open it. Type. Okay, so essentially, this is ba this is basically the code that you'd you'd, you'd find in uh, Rust. So in Rust's comp time interpretation, probably in Zig. And I've seen this probably, I've seen this in the hair lang, probably, I, I think, I don't know. But this, this code I took from the Rust uh, uh, interpreter, the Rust like constant evaluator. Essentially, if you want to check that a integer literal, so this literal passes a U64, if you want to check that it fits inside this, you essentially perform a truncation to the bit size, and then you perform a sign extension if it's signed, and then check does it fit in. Do you need the ABR due to I size or U size? Yes, yes, for U size. So this arc, essentially it's a pointer to an arc T and this arc T in, uh, is just a kind and a U8 for pointer size. It's either four or eight. Most of the time it's just eight. I only deal with 64 bit platforms. Uh, sometimes there'll be WASM, so it'll be four, four bytes in a uh, in an I size. Yeah, so you basically perform a truncation. So you take the size off, multiply it by eight, uh, shift it and this thing. So this is this is taken from Rust C's const eval. So this is basically it. Type ABI integer fits in. So it's just truncation. And then uh, so for unsigned types, you check if the truncation equals the literal. And then for signed types, you perform a sign extension and check if it equals the literal. And then returns fits in. So essentially, this is uh, generic. This is essentially generic over the size of the integer. So there's no need to get a big switch statement like before, like we had in the old eval interpreter. So in the old eval, eval interpreter last stream, I essentially had a big switch switch statement over all of the types, all of the integer types. But now it's just this type underscore size of multiply by eight to get bit size and then perform these bitwise operations just to check. So you do truncation and sign extension just to make sure that this integer fits in the inside the type. It's super simple, super generic, and you'll see where this comes into uh, later on. Hi, Sudan, Nick. Okay, so this is probably the this is probably like the hardest thing to get right for me, at least. Uh, like the ABI integer literal and like checking for overflow. I really don't know how this stuff works, right? So I so it was it was good that I was able to figure that out uh, just by looking what uh, at what Rust did. Okay, so switch to PO ordering. This is okay. Pub for module exporting and extern. So there's modules now in this language. Uh, this programming language uses a sort of VLang and Go like module system. So uh, let's just run it right now. Okay. Uh, let me just uncomment this. This will come in later. All right. So. Uh, so we have this thing uh, here. Okay, so let me run it. Yeah, so selected target 64 libc. That's fine. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about it now. Okay, so here, here is essentially our module tree. So these are the root. The root include. So essentially, the lib folder right next to the executable is the standard library. In VLang's case, it would be it would be a folder next to the executable called VLib. For now, I'm just calling it lib, and this is where all of the standard library code resides. So in lib, I have this thing called factorial dot, dot rec, and I have this thing, this dot pub put out in the front. So this pub is a keyword, and it means public. So this means I'm basically exporting it outside the module. So this is factorial, and let's go to rec, uh, like the, the main the main, uh, main thing, rec, everything. 
And let's just create a uh, comment missile. Okay, let's create a pub main. And since we'll just make it public, it doesn't have to be public. Uh, I'll explain where the public of main comes in later. But let's just go import factorial. Uh, let k equals factorial dot fact ack zero. Okay, so we're just calling it. And let's see what happens. Run it. Easy. So we're calling, so this is the module factorial. It's a child. It has one file because we imported it. This whole file system, module system, it's completely lazy. So it's only, it, it only reads files when it needs to, and it only reads directories when it needs to. Yeah, so uh, this is the main.main right here. We're calling let k equals factorial fact ack. Hold on. Yeah, so let k equals factorial fact ack, and then here, k equals factorial fact ack, call it with zero, and here, pub factorial dot fact ack. So this works fine. <laughs> They all get put together in one in one big module with all, with all the symbols. They all interoperate and connect with each other. Yeah. So if I didn't make it pub and re remove the pub, I'd run it. It'll go symbol factorial fact act is not public. Okay. So this is just the pub. Like you just put pub in front of things, and now we have a module system. It's the easiest thing in the world. This is uh like it's just import factorial dot something something, and this is essentially the v module system there's many reasons why the v module system is good uh i really admire it because it's uh because it's because it's just simple it's it's really simple there's, you don't have to mess with namespaces or anything all right so uh let's do this let's do extern let's, let's show extern so let's extern exit this so essentially uh this is equivalent to extern this. So you can, this is optional. This is only when you want to name it something else. Like let's go C, uh, let's just define C main. So main, C main here. So this is when you want to change the uh, extern, external symbol name and like in the elf symbols, but you can just call it. You can just call it uh, exactly like that. And that's how extern symbols work. You can make them pub as well. So you can make it a pub extern. So you can export external functions and you can use them. Here, yeah, let me uh, let me call this so C main, K equals C main, even though this doesn't make sense, but there it is. Extern main, main.c main, because it still gets a symbol with a, uh, with a prepended like namespace, but you can still call it main.c main, k0 and red. So, uh, that's simple. It's, it's a module system. So, uh, yeah, uh, pub, module exporting. Okay, ABI, change arc platform to assume different ROS. So, this is where I started implementing the module system. And this goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven commits. This goes seven commits. And this is where the most important things. Uh, the most important thing. So I'm going to explain how I really want the language to work. Essentially with... Oh, hey, Nick Walzer. Essentially, how, this is essentially how I want the language to work with its freestanding capabilities. So uh, let's go targets. So when I was designing this language, basically six months ago, I was sitting in an exam hall. And artifact, oh, they're all in root folder. It annoys me, all of the source. Well, since they're all in the root, they're exactly where I need them and they're exactly where I can see them. Uh, you know, that's just how I like to do it. Okay, so six months ago, I was sitting in the exam hall and I was designing this language. And one of the, one of the uh, files that I ended up writing was this thing. Don't worry about the top. But essentially, this is just me add. So how I write notes is I write stuff, and then as new information comes in, I put it above. So the oldest information is at the bottom, even though it should be here. So let me let me just go to. Okay, so this is just some hair lang stuff. Oh, 
Okay, okay. So, this is a systems programming language. Eventually, someone is going to want to extend the runtime or platform code. In some cases, they'll even add to it. So, let's say, uh, let's say your, your programming language and you're writing a freestanding, freestanding implementation and your, your standard library depends on runtime capabilities. So, let me create an example. Let's go to git from to quiet lift two. Uh, test projects. Let's open up a test project right here. Now, let's say this is just a standard library, and let's say let's say you want to open a file. So, if you want to open a file, you need to talk to the operating system. So, what you'd need to do is extern uh, f open something, right? Okay, but now this isn't this isn't portable. This isn't portable at all because in Wasm you'd get something like extern f open something under a certain namespace so this isn't portable this is only portable to the c standard library what you'd really want to do is this import runtime uh, f open is a function that returns a file this is what you'd want to do so this is your standard library code your standard library code imports from the runtime. And then the standard library code uses this runtime, the runtime magic and stuff like that. So it's it's all it's all uh, combined together. So let's just create a folder, call it uh, platform, platform.rec, uh, dot rt. So this is the runtime. And we'll just name this start. And then let's just extern main c main or just any kind of main, any main, you name it, stop. And then we'll just insert whatever we want. This is platform specific code. This is, this is where everything starts. And then we'll name a, we'll make a function, pub f open. All right, so right now, this is our main function in, in our runtime that we're defining. So this is where execution starts. And this is this thing. Uh, we're defining a function called f open, and let's put this in. Let's just put this lib inside the lib folder. All right. So we have two. We have two folders here. This is the runtime. This is your platform. How it works? It's just platform plus rt. So when you configure the compiler, you'd point it to platform, and this would all work fine. So this thing, this folder, you're essentially defining a platform you're defining a platform in all of its runtime code. The idea of having a platform and a runtime, they're merged together. So how I'd eventually want for the compiler, as I want to, inside the standard library directory, I want to have a bunch of runtimes. I want to have like uh, wasm.rt and things like that. But for now, this is, this is how it's going to be. So this is, our, this is our standard library. Our standard library needs to interface with the operating system. You, it's not, it's not right to, I want to define the runtime in standard library in terms of each other, in terms of a pluggable uh, runtime with a common interface. So this is what this import runtime thing sort of does. You have, uh, you have a common interface that you're declaring inside this library, and then it's up to the runtime to implement it. So the runtime is implementing it here by exporting a function, f open, uh, it just returns file and you can use it inside the runtime so let's say you have a uh, pub open file uh, file and then it just calls f open and this is essentially uh, detaching runtime and library code together so the standard library code is this, this generic thing where you can swap out runtimes and define a common interface. And it's up to the runtime to implement. So this is just the import runtime keyword. What is important now is the import main keyword. So let's, let's, create, let's create a main, main function. So main.rec. And we'll just create a pub main. And we'll just make it do nothing. Okay, right now, right now, this does nothing. This is a main function that just returns the empty tuple. 
And so how do we how do we access this in the runtime? So this is, this is the runtime code, and this is where execution starts. So how do we get from main? So how you'd want to get the main function is you'd want to do this, import underscore main. Main is this to this. And then you call it main. Done. So now there's two different, there's like, there's three different worlds. There is the main, this is the main module. There is the standard library code and there is the runtime. So the runtime, standard library code and main, they can all they can all import to each other through cyclically through a standard interface. So you can have the main function here and this be a certain signature. And if you want to bring it into the runtime, you can do this, import main and use it here. And you can define a common interface. So a specific main module might want to accept certain parameters or it might want to return something. So let's say this main instead of the runtime, it must return an i32. It must return an i32. And then we can just do this, any main. Must return an i32. And in the main code, this will raise an error. This will raise an error because it's supposed to return something. So it's i32, uh, 50. So now this doesn't raise an error anymore. So, uh, here we go. Yeah, merge platforms and systems. Yeah, so a user can define their own platform with, which is inferred by a runtime. Yeah, and this is an example of a runtime for WebAssembly. So let's say this is the this is the main function inside the main module. You're importing from a runtime a write to a file descriptor with a buff, and then you're calling it in here. And then this is the runtime. You're exporting a a uh, thing called called write, and then you're implementing it. So this is essentially the way I want to go with platform specific code. So one one of my examples that I took one of the examples that I took a lot of uh, things from is Zig. So if you take a look at Zig, how was it implemented? So let's go to start Zig. All right, and what does it do? At the very top, it imports root. This is essentially our import main. This is, this is essentially our import main, but uh, a little more a little more powerful because you can perform uh, uh, type reflection. But think of this as our import main. So what does Zig do with the root? It calls it. Yeah, so uh, main2 root.main it calls it you can access the main function and there's type reflection here to assert that main is a certain type so if main is no return it just returns it if main is void it calls it returns zero main's a u size returns it uh, and if it's a uefi status returns it so this is essentially very similar to how i'm implementing this like asserted import main sort of thing so the runtime code is just imports main and asserts something. And if you wanted to make a runtime, let's just call it like wasm.rt. And you did a start. You'd want to import main, main i32, and then that's it. You can define a start, you can call main, and that's it. So it's just wasm.rt. And what happens is when you call when you call the compiler, it lists these runtimes. So we have runtime zero and runtime one. Runtime zero's name is libc, and runtime one name is wasm. So we have these two things, lib, libcrt, lib, wasmrt. And what we're doing in main is, yeah, we're calling this with an arc and a platform. So our platform is libc, but platform and runtime are analogous. So Essentially, uh, let, let me just, let me recap it. So, uh, runtimes, the system libraries and main, they all need a common interface through where their types can be asserted in between each other. And having the, having the standard library not implement all of the platform specific code 
and leaving it to a pluggable runtime makes everything just a lot nicer essentially because you can define you can define your own platforms without modifying the compiler or modifying the standard library so uh i def i i implemented this with free sending targets in mind let's say i wanted to compile this compiler to WebAssembly and host it on my website right so this is a completely it may be on the architecture wasm 32 but this is a completely different platform. It's a completely different runtime. There is no standardized way to print, right? You could go with WASI or MScripten, but what if you wanted something really thin? So what you could, in, in the root of your directory, you could define your platform plus RT, write the runtime specific code, hook everything up, and then compile it. So this makes, this makes freestanding code really easy to implement without going into the standard library and editing it, without going into the compiler and editing it. You can define your own platforms using folders. You can define your own platforms using folders, and implement runtime specific code inside your platform directory and have them import with each other and import through a common interface. And that's how, that's kind of like a revenue, that's kind of like a revolutionary system that no one's ever really done. No one's ever really done this sort of, I, I think, I think if you go to older languages like Ada, they probably have this sort of thing. But in newer languages, it's more of a focus on the standard library has everything in it. The standard library has all of the platform specific code. The standard library has all of the runtime specific code. Why can't we just have a separate interface? So the runtime is pluggable. The standard library depends on a common interface. The runtime imports from main using a certain uh, import assertion. It's, it's, just these, it's just these types of things that make, uh, just make um, like modular code, separation of platform specific code, really easy in this language. And, th and this module system has really never been done before, as far as I know of. Hello, spider. Welcome. Okay, so let's see. Let's just see what I have now. What I have now is this. Uh, this is what I have now. So, this is the main. This is the main. Uh, the main thing that I that I call it on. So let's just delete everything inside this folder. And here, so this is libc plus rt. This is inside the lib directory. The lib directory is essentially the include path for the standard library. Any anything with a plus RT in here is a runtime, and this gets uh, and this gets compiled down. So inside main, we're basically requesting the architecture of C sixty four. So the st standard C. I think I can name it like C. It's the C ninety nine sixty four. I mean that's probably a cool name. Probably name it that to make it uh. To make it proper anyway so we're requesting the architecture of c uh 64 bits and the platform of libc and we have a platform here this platform is defined in the standard library so let's go let's go to the start and this is how it's defined so we're importing main and main is just accepts nothing returns nothing so this is just an import assertion we're importing main and then we're calling it here we're uh we're exporting a symbol main we're calling the c underscore main and it returns i32, we're calling main.main .main and returns zero. So let's run it. And keep note that we have nothing in this this uh, this file right here. All right, so let's run it. All right, so it says unknown, unknown ident main. So let's include it, main this. All right, and then it says, Symbol main dot main is not public. Uh, this this should raise an error on the user's side. So but it does raise an error on other things. So let's so this is essentially our main function. Let's type it as something not right. Let's name it main equals fifty. And then we'll run it. Uh, we'll make it pub just so the runtime can access it. And what does it do here? So 
symbol main.main has wrong type. Import assertion expected accept nothing, return nothing. And this is here. So these interfaces don't match. It'll raise an error to the user. It'll tell them where they uh, where they wrote it and where the error comes from. All right, so let's just comply with this interface. So let's make it return nothing. And we'll just do just do like let, let A. We'll just do something in here. We'll just do something. And we'll call it. All right, so it works. So we'll end up with this. pub main.main. A0 equals 20 and just return nothing. And the runtime function. Run rt dot c main. And it just calls main.main. So we could essentially start compiling C right now. We have everything. We have everything here. We have the we have the uh, runtime. We have the extern C main function, and we have the R main function from R language. So we can start compiling C now, really, if we really wanted to. But uh, not yet. Not yet. There is still stuff I need to implement as well, uh, namely the uh, import runtime. But this this was good for now. This is good for now. So, this is how I want that. That is basically I just explained the entire module system of this uh, of this programming language. It's, I just wanted to I just wanted to get it down for the record, and I used uh, I used Zig as inspiration. Just because Zig has a certain pluggable, freestanding main implementation where you can just have this and. Have all your code here but it's not it's not really extendable in the sense where you don't need to touch the uh the standard library the standard library so if you don't need to touch the standard library it's basically extendable the whole language is extendable on its own so that's essentially what i did so this is where it started i changed arc platform to assume different roles and i made platform platform slash runtime to be uh creatable they're dependent by file system so this libc plus rt will create the runtime slash platform of libc yeah so here abi change arc platform so zero one two three four five six file system directed platform runtimes and crossword import imports as well and this thing this is what i implemented today basically a couple hours ago so import implement import man Okay, and then uh, I I think I explained enough. I think I explained enough of that. But what I have to what I uh, did before is uh, here evaluate globals properly. So let's just comment out this this runtime code because I don't want to I don't want to clog up my output. So let's just define a global test equals fifty and let's run it. All right, what does it do? It is main dot test. I have to do two H I R was do red 50 and there's this thing in brackets here called const and what that means is uh over here where is it oh, it's in hr now yeah. is it not even here there's a global team right all right, it's here. Okay, so this is the definition of a global. It has the IR descriptor, which is just list of locals, the entry point, and things like that. This is just the root of the expression tree, and it has its type, uh, the location of its type, if it's uh, if it has a type annotation, uh, if it's mutable, and this thing HAR underscore expert uh, constant with a constant. So it can be null or not. So you can have constants which are not runtime which are not which are not known at compile time you can have constants defined at compile time this is because i want this sort of duck typed constant so i don't want to be able to i don't want to put const at the front of all of my types at the front of all of my globals i just want it to either be immutable or mutable so this is Im immutable or mutable and it's just sort of, this sort of like this sort of like duck type system. It keeps it keeps everything clean. Yeah. So you have a global and it has an optional constant. So this is if this is after this is after constant evaluation. So this thing would be filled to an integer literal. 
All right, so where does this get run? So I changed I changed the way passes get get uh get like orchestrated. And instead of running over all three passes with a step step step, I just have a function called hir passes and where that's where this run is here. So this runs this runs everything in one go. This iterates over all the symbols. So symbol proc, it runs typing and then normalization. So it doesn't write it doesn't do typing over all the symbols. It does all the passes, all the passes, all the passes, all the passes on each symbol. So it's an iterative all the way down. There's a reason why. Um, the reason why is because this puts everything in order, in topological order. No, it won't be a pain to multi-thread because um, uh, if I get everything into strongly, strongly connected components, uh, it essentially it works. It works out. I've written notes on how I want to multi-thread this. The reason why it has to go iterative one by one is because everything gets in topological order and there's ways to to check things uh, irrespective of order as well so it's fine don't don't worry about multi-threading anyway so symbols underscore po sense with post order so we do a post order traversal on all the symbols basically our post order is this topological sort so it goes one by one by one and let's say you're checking a global at the top and we've when and we've evaluated it so let's say we have value 50 it goes on to the next global, and this global depends on the global before. So we need to know its constant evaluated state, basically. We need to know its constant evaluated uh, value before we before we uh, get down below. So we can't we can't do a full typing pass, uh, full normalization pass, and then full uh, evaluation pass. Uh, that's not we we can't do it that way. Yeah. So let's go here. Symbol underscore global. So we essentially type it. Uh, and then we normalize it. It should be, yeah, that's, that's, uh, erroneous. Yeah. So essentially we perform a type checking over all the things, uh, and then we perform a normalization and then we perform evaluation. So this is where, this is the entry point to the evaluation, uh, over here. All right. So this is, this is a lot, this is a lot better than the, than the, uh, last constant evaluator that we wrote last stream. So this is, this is our E result. This is what you've seen before. It's a 64 bit type, eight bytes. And notice how there's no I 64, right? There's no I 64. Everything, everything has explicit underscore size. Uh, yeah, everything has an explicit underscore size. There is no, there is no notation of signed or unsigned. Every e result underscore t will be paired with its type, so you know its type anyway. So we're not essentially reinterpreting a bag of bits we have no idea about. We know the type of whatever values are stored in here. So we're essentially removing the fields. Uh, th these fields aren't based on types. They're they're based on sizes now. Okay, so you've seen this the e desk. You've seen it before. Uh, I've added this boolean. So false if not constant expression because constants are duct typed so if we if we are accessing if we're constant evaluating something and we don't know it's we, we can't determine it at compile time it just silently fails and assigns nothing to the to the constant yeah so we, you've seen this you've seen this here this is the most this is the important thing uh ehir infix eval where this gets called is here expert underscore infix it does the left hand side the right hand side and evaluates them and that returns the e result all right it asserts type is integer because we don't really it's what floats yet okay so it checks if it's science so i'm going to go over i'm going to go over how you perform the this infix operation like performing infix operations irrespective of type so before um before last stream we implemented we did we basically did something like this switch type and then case type i32 all the way down for 10 different types that is number one that's slow and it's a pain to write so what you can do now is do this sort of generic thing and this is basically what i talked about at the start of the stream where you can generically check if an integer fits inside the type so we do it like this. So check if it's signed. If it is signed, we perform a sign extension to convert a smaller type to just the sign extended version of this U64. And we just check these things at the start. We just check uh, overflow at the start. So if talk, uh, if the operation is div or mod, and if A, 
is the signed int minimum and b is negative one that's an overflow so let's say you have uh int min divided by negative one that this is an overflow basically in the um uh, in like two's complement arithmetic two's complement integers this is an error this is an overflow uh undefined behavior so we raise an error uh well not division by zero but we just do a go to here go to this label ov integer overflow underflow Okay, so this just performs a sign extension before we actually start doing the binary operations. All right, so I, I define these two macros here. I mean, before it used to be uh, if cases, like I, I'm putting these macros here because I'm eventually going to have base, like a ton of these operators and I don't want it to take, I don't want to do a lot of typing. So essentially, uh, when you call BT, this just takes in a uh, built-in and it is like this. So it matches on the op. If it's signed, it performs the built-in with signed operands. And if it's unsigned, it performs the built-in with unsigned operands. And here, built-in add overflow and built-in sub overflow, built-in mul overflow. So if these return true, these are overflows. So it performs the operation with on 64 bits, even if it's like uh, one byte sized or two byte sized, it performs the uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, anything on the huge 64 bit uh, wide type. And then there's, yeah, so if, if that operation doesn't fit inside 64 bits, it jumps here. And now after we've checked if it fits in 64 bits, if it then doesn't fit in the bits of the destination type, here, you perform this go to to here. So tape, type ABI integer fits in. You saw this inside the checker and this is the code essentially we're reusing it and we just go to here. So it's just, yeah, so BT, we perform overflow, overflow, and then PT, this just requires, uh, there is no there is no overflow setting because we've already, we've already checked the stuff up here. And with, with division and modulo, they can only get smaller. They, they don't get, they don't get bigger. Yeah, so this is essentially how you implement uh, infix operations, like generically over over bit size, with respect to signed and unsigned. So this this is taken from the uh, Rust const eval code, like the const the const in, the const interpreter code. And this was another thing that was really hard to get right, but it does work, and you only have to write it once. Yeah, so it just returns a res with a d underscore sixty four r. And since it's sign extended, it works fine. You can take any slices of that 64-bit size, interpret it as whatever you want. You see, it, uh, define bail. So implement duck typed best effort constants for now. If we can't const eval an expression, we branch out a return. So this just performs a long jump. Yeah, so default bail. Uh, yeah, so infix, integer literal. Yes, yeah, so you've seen this. Uh, R, D64, X per D integer, return. I expert infix. Expert local, yes, yeah, so just checks, use of uninitialized local. So you've seen this before. Performs a mem copy. Yeah, so symbol, symbol. So if sim kind equals equals symbol proc bail, because we haven't implemented calling on uh const eval, and I don't want to implement calling, not till later. And yeah, so sim d global constant equals null. So if constant isn't um if it's not a constant, like if it's not a constant, we just bail and else we just perform an evaluation on this thing. And uh, no other expressions we bail. Yeah, so assignment. Yeah, you've seen this before. And here, you HAR construct expert. So this is what happens at the very end. So we perform set jump, we evaluate all the statements. And when we get to here, if it has a result, we essentially construct an expression. So we're calling this EHIR construct expression. It returns a uh, root of an expression. So we're putting in the E result, its type and its location. And then we're just assigning global constant equals expression. Yeah, and this, this runs it over like this. So this is our E result. If type equals bool, we just do it like a type pun. We just check the union of bool. If it's integer, uh, if it's signed, we create a unary subtraction. And this is a not reach, this is a tutor. Okay, so this that's basically how I implement 
constant evaluation. So we give test zero equals 50 plus test. We run it. Because it goes down by down, 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 iterative, we can just have this done. This is completely done before we get to here. And yeah, const equals uh, 100. All right, so this is what I want to this is what I want to implement in the stream. This so let's go pub main. Uh, let k is an array of test amounts of i thirty two. All right, so how how do you type check this? How do you type check this? So in in compilers in in other languages uh, i mean i was talking to someone a while ago and i think i put it as a clip on my youtube channel i was talking to someone a while ago about how they would go about implementing this constant evaluation because if you look at this this is pretty hard how would how does zig implement this okay zig implements it by basically having the whole language comp time okay how, how does Rust implement it uh it builds up a separate intermediate representation to then perform evaluation and each constant is its own symbol. So I want to kind of go in Rust direction. So if you take a look at this, it's just test equals two, let K array of test either do two equals this. And there's, there's, there's a reason why this is really simple because this iterative going top to bottom, uh, why, what does C do? Uh, there, this is a VLA. This becomes a variable length array. If you really wanted it to be at constant, you'd have to do this. But with yeah, with uh, with C twenty three, you can do const expert test equals two. And this is what I'm really appreciative of because they're they're adding like genuine constant expressions, typed constant typed constant expressions, mind you. Uh, so I don't have to go with defines anymore. Anyway, so the reason why this is so easy in the language is because you're going top to bottom. Once you reach main, you already know what test is. Once you reach main, you already know what the what the constant value of test is. So if you do this, let's see, let's see what else. So this is, this is, this is going to raise an error. All right, unexpected test, expected expected integer or uh, brace. So. Let's see how we're going to implement this. So this this test is a global symbol. If we're going to do something like this, like a, like five plus twenty, it'll create a. So yeah. So this five plus twenty, it'll create a underscore and non equals this, and then insert that here. This is what Rust does. It creates these separate anonymous symbols to take place as as constants. All right, so this is this is what we want to this is what we want to get done. Test equals two, uh, and then we have this here. So what we need to do right now, right now, what we have as the definition of a of a uh, like array with known size. How it is is just this: it's a struct with a size is a u size, so it's just the amount of size, and the it's just a type is a type t. So it's just these two things. And what I want to do this stream is implement size as a R sim T reference to a global symbol. So this has to be referenced to a global symbol. Or I could probably store like a reference to a global symbol or inline U64. I probably want to do inline. Inline is probably the way to go because I want to uh, update these. Okay. So let's go. Unexpected test, expected integer, or this. So just copy this entire thing and see where it goes. All right, this thing. Let me just close just close everything. This is here. So this is in p type underscore expert. So we're just parsing types with respect to a precedence. And here, uh, open square brackets. So we can either be 5i32 or empty i32. So this is slice, and this is array. All right, if p.token.kind equals talk integer, does this, else if uh, talk c square, does this. So what we need to do is perform, I think we'll do like a p global 
something. We'll, we'll do we'll do we'll do a way to parse a parse an expression and register it as a uh like a global anonymous uh like variable. So yeah, so int size is array. Yeah, so we'll we'll define we'll define an int size. So let's go u64 int size. integer and let's let's uh let's define where we we pass an integer because i don't want to duplicate code okay so this is this is where we pass an integer all right i'll put this in the util code yeah but i'm gonna have to yeah the most annoying thing ever in c is dealing with uh includes because i have to scroll all the way up to the top just to get this shit in okay so we get this all right u64 p pass int let me just paste this and then we'll just put in the token And we got error no and return let. All right, p pass int, and then we'll define this in parser.h. Okay, and then we can get parser expo to call this. Good, and now we don't have to duplicate any kind of code at all. We can go to util. So I want it to, I want it to parse one of two things. I want it to parse a integer literal or a constant constant initializer. One of two. So if uh, actually if the token dot kind does not equal. Expected expression, yeah. Actually, okay. So it's one of two. So if p dot token dot kind does not equal talk, uh, talk integer. Well, okay. If it equals talk integer, and then we'll just get a this thing. And we'll just do p type what's it called p pars int yeah p dot token all right and then we'll just do a p next yeah so this definitely this definitely is an array all right else 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 so we want to parse a constant expression so We'll we'll make this unimplemented. Actually, no. We have to implement it. So we'll do something like this. Uh, rsim. We'll make it return to rsimt p const expression. P const expression. All right. And then we'll let let's call it rsimt. Oh yeah, I'm gonna change this code down here because I don't want it to pass. Oh yeah, and then if and size val equals equals zero. Yeah, we'll, we'll put the error here. All right, and then probably to do put this next to const eval code in checker. Okay, good. So, 
Yep, and we can just do this. Length equals int size val. Okay, so let's parse a const expression, so pconst expression. And what we'll need to do is essentially use pexpr with the... So we need, we need to create a global. We need to create an anonymous global. Create anonymous global. And how did I do how did I do that before? I did it here when uh, in the parser down below. Here we are. Okay, so right here p import import main so this is this is the implementation of the this is the implementation of the import underscore main and how i implement import underscore main it is just represented as a symbol and because this symbol because this uh this, this global symbol here yeah see how it's a uh yeah so we're creating a symbol we're, we're registering a symbol called a symbol underscore import assertion and inside the reorder pass import assertion this takes part in the uh this takes part in the post order traversal so it's definite successes which means a which means that import main when you reach an import main it's already type checked the things in its body so this is just a really easy way to implement import main by making it integrate with the post order traversal reorder pass so you end up reaching the import main when its body has essentially already been type checked and then you can perform the uh the checks yeah and we pull, we perform the checks in the checker and we, we just do this so hir type import which is c type unify in and so we just check if the if the type of the symbol equals the type here so that, that's basically how i implement import underscore main and it integrates with the global symbol table and then it integrates with the personal traversal so what i'll need to do is create an anonymous global and i create an anonymous symbol here by calling table underscore anon symbol and this returns a this thing this anon something here All right, so let's just take this. Just take the whole thing and we can put it right here. There we go, pass const expression. So to, to call pexpr, we need an ir underscore desk. So we need it. We need an ir descriptor, which means we need to create a global. So let's just do it here. So this is a symbol, table anonymous symbol, no name. Uh, its location is this thing, just lock t. This is the start. And then we'll just call the symbol. Look, it's a global symbol. It is uh, D global. And we'll see. Uh, I just need to make sure I find out what's in the global again. Actually, we want this thing. It's this thing. All right. So it's just a desk type, type block is mine. Okay. So, uh, we need to create an IR desk. So let's create it here. Uh, desk is desk. Type is unknown. We don't know it yet. Uh, actually, we kind of do know its type. He const u size actually we'll put in its type so it expects um it expects a u size type lock is just nothing and is mat is mat equals and constant is already nothing okay so this is our global and we call pconst expression. We have to put in type u size. 
Okay, great. So we register symbol. Okay, so let's let's just start parsing. So P expert, we're passing in the desk with the expected uh expected type. Oh no, it's prep. Yep. Okay, and then we're gonna to do uh, mask. Okay, this can be done off stream because this is a very big bug. Okay, so we're just gonna call P expert and get a reference to a HR. Yep. And then desk HIR equals uh, this thing. All right, simple. This is probably uh, one of the easiest functions. Uh, it's just creating an IR descriptor. We're passing it to PXP or passing an expression. We're assigning that thing to here. We're allocating this on here. And we construct an anonymous symbol of global. It's a uh, type expected put in the descriptor is pub extern. Yeah, so this is an anonymous symbol that we're creating and it's exactly what Rust does for constants. What Rust does is when it comes across a thing that needs to be computed at compile time, like an array uh, brace initializer, it constructs a separate symbol where you can run over, you can run over it. Now, what does this return? It returns the, yeah, return table register. All right, p const expression. Now let's see. All right, so we got to here. What we can do is do a uh, unwind. I want to see what it prints out. All right, so we have a like a non. We have this like a non symbol, which is just main main dot test. Right. Okay. Now we'll do uh, bool is array symbol because we don't have any. We don't have like some types in C. And then we just do a asymp. Uh, const sim. All right, so is array symbol is true. Const sim equals sim. All right. Okay, and then if is array, we'll do this instead. So let's just let's change the type info. So this is d underscore array. So we'll put a bool in here. Bool is symbol. After checking will be uh, disregarded. All right, so it can either be length or an awesome symbol. We'll do it just a union. All right, so D symbol or D length. All right, so we'll extract this here. Info. If is array symbol. Info dot. Yeah, and we'll have to put if it's a symbol as well. Is symbol. Who else? Done. D size. D length. Okay. What does it do now? So there's errors. Oh, because we changed the name of these things. So yeah, we'll go assert. No. So set that it's not a symbol yet. Just uh, just not yet. And we'll go in here, type me expert. Uh, and we'll name this with this maybe D length. Alright, even more errors. What about here? 
So this is uh, type info is like some hash con stuff. So let's make this D length. Yeah, I should probably just compare the bag of bits, like, to do, compare, compare, like, POD instead. I should be doing that. Okay, uh, then we're just doing D, array symbol. Yeah, this, this gets annoying, this gets annoying. D symbol LM All right, so LM and then D Yeah, that's that's annoying All right, what else here we go, okay, so this is where we're printing so what we need to do is Okay, so if, if, yeah, it's ty if type info uh, array is symbol, the print. Okay, what I should have done instead is, uh, print. Is it? this is a debug string. Actually, yeah, so the code is, the code is right. right. Good, what else? I think that's it. All right, type mismatch. Expected u size got i thirty two. Wow. Okay, so we're, we're already we're already checking. We're already like type checking this thing. All right. I wonder where that's being raised. So yeah. Uh. So we have main dot test here, which is our global, and then we have this anon u size, which is this thing here, this anonymous thing. Uh, yeah, this is not okay. So what we'll need to do is probably like We need to cast this to a use size as well. We'll need to cast it. I think what we can do is Yeah, to make to make to make friction to make I don't I don't want to like push types onto things as soon as possible. I think I want to I want to reduce friction and make it so it's inferred and then we check if it's within bounds and not check the type instead. Uh, it'll make it'll make sense soon. Is there a util? Yeah, let's just go to just go to where we were before. All right, and just remove expected. We're gonna remove expected. All right. You pass void. Thank God. Okay, type mismatch. Expected and non this got this. So this is this is good so far. This is this is good so far. We're doing well. Alright, where's where's this error get raised? Uh B long jump run BT. This is this is how I like uh This is how I like debug. My compiler. I just put it into GDB, break on long jump, and just run, and then click BT, uh, and it fills up my whole screen. That's where we go. Hi, typing. In this thing. Okay, so we're right here. Okay, so before I start, uh, where is this expert let? Okay, this performs unification. So we'll need to go to where a expert array. Expert array. There we are. So type T LM type. This is essentially where we type check type checking. So what I want to do first is remove the check to array length being zero. See, I put that to do there for a reason. 
I want to handle everything in one go. So LM up value. So we'll need to essentially do a, like a pre-processing thing. Actually, uh, t -t 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 you know what would be easier? What would, okay, what would be easier? So let's just go take a look at the type table so far. So th this is the type table. It contains a list of types. So let's go at type zero. We'll have something like a array type of a non-zero. We'll have an array type of a non-zero. And this thing here, this will reference T zero. This is essentially is ref this is a referencing this in the type table. So what I could do, what I could do in the type checker is if I if I encounter a type like this, I want to update it. But that comes with errors. Right? That com that comes with errors. See uh th this type table is immutable. This type of what this type table is immutable. When you put stuff inside and you want to change it, you'd have to construct an entirely new type. And the thing is with the type with things with the type checker, it doesn't really it it do, it's not like the normalizer where it goes through over every expression and updates it. The type checker doesn't really inspect all the types. It just performs unification and doesn't really change any types. Uh, so what you could end up with is this K being in a non thingy and not updating it see this is really error prone in the checker you'd have to check every single place where a type could be and then update it you'd have to end up you'd have to end up updating it um which i don't want what i do want though what i do want though is something is something like this right so let's say let's say i let's say i finish type checking test and since I know, so, uh, let's let's say I finish type checking test, and then I also finish type checking uh, a non zero, which is test. So let's say I finish type checking test, and I finish type checking a non zero. And what it, what this is is uh, this is basically a non zero. All right, so I'm up to here. I'm up, I'm right here, and test will return back an i thirty two because. This is like unannotated. And uh, right here, right here. So we've checked a non zero and it's an I32. Now, the fact that it's a anonymous, it's the fact that it's an anonymous, uh, like global, we can go through all of the type tables. We can go through, and since, since there's only, since there's only one type that references a non, if I created another one, it would reference a different uh, global. And a different, a different, a different. So what you could do is do something like kind of unsafe. And after we check a non-zero, we can uh, update all types in the type. We have we can do a we can do a search. We can do a search through all the type tables, and like update it. That's what we can do, and that relies on the fact that there is only one type in existence that refers to this one global in existence. If there was two two types, uh. It wouldn't really work. It wouldn't really work. It would be back at square one on the checker example where we'd have to f go to every single type exactly where a type could be and update, update it. I think this is a simple solution, but a hacky one. But I kind of need hacky solutions right now because I want to get this done. So, and hey, maybe through a different perspective, it isn't so hacky. Uh, but that perspective, uh, I don't have that perspective right now. Okay, so let's put this back to normal. So it's just test, test. And we run it. Uh, we'll run it. Yeah, hackiness is by perspective. Okay, type mismatch expected this, got this. So let's do something like this. 
inside the HIR passes. So symbol global. We've essentially evaluated the whole thing. And we probably want to put in a flag that it's a global. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll first, we'll first, we'll search the entire type table. References, ref, references to this global. Okay, so do a for loop of uh, i equals zero. I is less than types len. Now, I don't know how the type table is defined. Okay, it's just types and type len. Okay, I love globals. Okay, type len. And then I plus plus. So we'll go over all of them. We'll get a type info. So TI T info type. Name this info. And if info dot D array dot is symbol, uh, we'll have to check its array as well. If info dot kind equals equals type array. We'll have to. Yeah, we'll we'll uh we'll name we'll make a separate function. We'll go uh hir. Hir global is const expert. Global const expert. And we'll call it with the symbol and the global. Here. All right, so we'll need to search the entire type table for references to this global. So, uh, assumed that only one global okay. Uh, we'll just do founds. Do a T info. Uh, equals now. Do F. I'm going to do F info. Yeah, I info. Okay, equals now. And then if we find it, we'll just set info to info and break. Uh, sim d array dot d symbol equals d sim. We need to put in the r sim as well. I feel like that's I feel like that's better. Was r sim. All right, so we're passing in the reference to the symbol, and if it equals, we break, and then. If it was null return. Okay, so now we have a essentially a an array type that references this global. So first we'll we need to check a couple things. One, is this global uh is this global a constant? And is this global a positive integer? Is this global a constant and is this global a positive integer? So we'll check if uh, we need it, we need a reference to the symbol. So we'll go Okay, so we'll get a reference to the symbol if sim d uh, no no d global is not constant. We'll raise an error. So error with pos. And name it uh, global uh, is it lock. No, we need, we need the symbol. Symbol lock. And then we'll get the SV from sim key. All right, global is under constant. 
probably just yeah it's not a constant okay and then is this global or positive integers let's just do an assert not reach for now oh wow where does this come from okay so good good we got no way here uh let's just make it something that we don't know is constant right we'll just name we'll just make it like false okay the reason why okay this is very obviously a constant expression but we don't handle it uh and when you don't handle it we bail so this is not a constant expression so it arose an error global uh and non-zero is not a constant so yeah so this this points us to the right this points us to the right place uh we probably shouldn't we probably shouldn't write global uh not a constant expression uh okay and then we'll probably should name this function yeah oh it is right okay global context but okay so not a constant expression all right so this this isn't constant uh we'll just make this 50 and then it is constant and we get right here so let's actually handle this let's actually handle it so we need to check is it even a positive integer so there are no globals uh, no there are no negative integers in the here only Yeah, there are no positive, there are no negative integers in the HIR, only positive ones prepended with unary minus. So, if sim, uh, if sim the global, so we'll, we have a reference to the global, we're not even using it. Where do we reference sim? Okay. Yeah, I don't really like this global and sim pair because... They're basically the same thing, but they just have like slightly less information. So we need to include both, which is annoying. Okay, if global uh, constant type uh, kind equals equals hir u uh, was it sub hir pre what's it called um it's called something prefix oh it's called x for prefix and global Constant. Okay, I'll, I'll put this into a separate variable. Extra expert. Uh, okay, so if expert.kind and expert. Uh, D in D prefix. Okay, and prefix dot up equals equals uh expert underscore k sub so this is a unary negation and we'll have to actually check that the left hand side is an integer as well and expert dot kind equals equals expert integer literal okay raise an error no no negatives allowed so we'll, we'll raise an error error with pause negative uh negative integer constant can't have negative array size okay can't have negative array size and then we'll just put this here all right so we get back to here and then we'll just test it with a negative array size so we'll put negative 50 out the front uh, oh not a constant expression because okay we don't handle we don't handle unary negative so let's just handle that real quick uh it's a simple simple update go to eval okay we'll, we'll handle this real quick it should be fine uh where is it okay so expert prefix and we'll just switch over Okay, so there's only two things that can be in the op. It could be a uh, Boolean negation or a sub. So we'll just check over these. Yes. So Boolean negation is easy. Uh, let's get let's get the left hand side. So e result. Uh, let's do uh, e 
Okay. And then not is just D bool equals D bool. Yeah, I'll make this R. So we already have a variable for that. All right, and then for sub, it's super simple. This type is flow. So integer. Yeah, yeah. I mean that should be fine. Uh, we'll just put, we'll just remove this. We'll just make this and we we'll just make this that. All right, and then return R. The center of each other. Okay, so this should work. We're running it. Okay, a set not reached. I don't know why. Why is that happening? Why is it? Why is it a set not reached? Yeah. Okay. Let's do. Let's just bail out of the entire thing. I want to get it printing. So error rewind, or unwind. Let's just get it printing. Const is negative 50 oh okay so i didn't write it i didn't write it right so it should be expert uh d prefix dot expert dot kind okay so can't can't have negative array size this works perfectly can't have negative array size okay so no negatives allowed and no zeros allowed Okay, so we'll... All right, is it global a non-zero integer? So let's extract the actual value. So let's get a u64. Uh, let's just go here, u64. This expert. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll check if it's actually an integer. If expert dot kind. Uh, we'll have to go Okay, we'll have to do it here. If expert dot find does not equal expert integer literal, not an integer. What we'll need to do is check the time. Okay, what, what, what we should do is this. What we should actually do is this. Right. We're not supposed to handle that. We're supposed to do this. We're supposed to check that the expert dot time equals equals uh we'll handle this soon okay so when we get to here it should it should be known that this is an integer literal it should be known that it's an integer literal because the type is int anyway all right so we'll extract the value so it's just expert d integer right value and then we'll just print it Uh, it's not long, long. It's just an LU. All right, so kind of negative array size. Sure. Uh, that's that's good. We'll minus it. What's it do now? Value equals fifty. Okay, so good, good. Well, I mean, what we can do now is uh, well, okay, we need to check if it's zero. We need to check if it's zero. Yep, yep, that works. Uh, let's just make it zero. Kind of zero negative. Uh, yeah, let's make it negative zero. What happens? It still goes to zero. Okay, good. Can't have zero array size. Great, great. Now, uh, we can essentially we'll need to check. Actually, no, no. This should be good. This this should be good. So we'll we'll just make it. Uh, we'll just change the info dot d array dot is symbol equals false size the length equals value done easy easy peasy I, I, mean, I think that should be good right Ooh. okay no this this error is supposed to raise anyway this error is supposed to raise anyway because we haven't handled a certain thing but i think i think this is good 
Hey, where does this? Where, what, what error is this? Okay, please fix this. Uh, just return. Return one because that's greater than zero. Okay, k zero. Wow, we just did it. Yeah, we we actually just did. We actually just did it. Uh, I can show you up here. Yeah, we we that's that's it. Well, there's more things we have to do. One is fix that error, and two, we have to make sure this is actually an integer. So, if expr if expr dot type, sorry, we have to check type is integer. If type isn't an integer, there is an error, not an integer. Okay. Yep. Yeah, this is good. All right, so now let's go back to where we inserted that error. I'll tell you where that comes from. It comes from here. Uh, type underscore size of. So we need to calculate the size of a type, basically. Uh, and for arrays, for arrays, we need to calculate the size of an array. So let's uh, let's do that real quick. I don't know how. Do these sizes have to be aligned? Probably they have to be aligned. Yeah. Okay. Let's um. Let's just let's just create a something symbol like this. So type array. Case type array. And I'm pretty sure I could fill it in for me, right? If you fill it in for me, I can just leave. What the hell? What does it think it is? Okay. So use uh, size. Equals zero four. Okay. Well, okay. No, all we have to do is just uh, I get. Okay, we can do type size. Up. A. So we need we need to grab. Okay, I don't know why I'm asking GPT for this. So we'll grab the T info. Yep, let's grab his type info. And we'll grab uh no, so assert info.d array is not a symbol because it can't be up to this point. Uh and then we'll get a we'll return type size of then in the arc and the lm multiplied by length. Okay, and then to do proper proper alignment and everything. Okay. I mean, I think we just did it, right? I think. Yeah, we'll make this larger. We'll make this four. All right. Type mismatch. Expected array of four. Got array of two. Yeah, yeah. I think I think this is good. I think this is good. Well, I think. Uh, that's it. That was anticlimactic. Okay, so we'll need to make this a size of four. Get this in here. All right, all right. Good stream. I do the first. Uh, I do. A, I do a commit. I do a commit. This is good so far. Paste. We'll undo that. Okay. Good. I don't know what to name it. We'll name it something like. Here we are. All right. Uh, we'll name it. So it has to do with. Hey, try it. Eval. Table. No. Parser. Checker. Wow. Yeah, we'll just do this. We'll make it shorter. Implement implement uh const expert in array types. What's the repo? Uh if you join my Discord, you'll be able to find it, but I can send you it. I'll put it in the chat. 
it is. Welcome to the stream. Okay, so let's commit. Implement const expert in array types. So this is what we did this stream. Works perfectly. All right, and then we'll uh, we'll go push that. Easy. One of the most straightforward things I do, uh, I've had to implement. Okay, but other than that, if anyone has anything to say, uh, I'm going to leave. Yeah, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'm gonna end the stream. Thanks for showing up. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, this is one of the most straightforward features I've had to implement, especially because, um, especially because like with, with globals, with, with globals and constant expressions, you can extract them out to symbols. And then those symbols take part in reordering. And then those symbols take part in constant evaluation, type checking. And then you can go through all of these hoops, but they all work fine, right? It, it, it's, it's a nice system that I built for myself in this compiler. Everything all weaves together. It's, uh, it's really nice. Uh, I feel like it really uh, did pretty well with the way I structured it. Anyway, thanks for showing up. Thanks, guys. All right, bye-bye.